Thank you so much for, for coming out, uh, the community. Uh, this is being taped, so we will reach a larger audience. Um, I'm going to try to not talk too long, although I did talk the other evening at the NAACP, and the reason I say that is when you start out with a few things to say, I think it ended up going for almost 45 to 50 minutes. So I have a lot to say about the Brockton Public Schools. Uh, many of you know I talk about it often. I've been in the district for 41 years, have held many, many different positions. This is my fifth year as your superintendent. And the one thing I say to your children all the time when I see them, whether it's award ceremonies, uh, whether it's you know going into the classrooms, one of the proudest things I am is the superintendent of the Brockton Public Schools. Because we have an excellent school system. We obviously, and, and you're involved if you're out here this evening, you know that we have lots of challenges in the district. But I always have faith that we will make sure that we get our community involved, our parents involved, our staff involved, to be able to deal with the challenges that, that we face each day. I want to thank right away uh, Principal Carlton Campbell from West Middle School, our new principal this year, for hosting us this evening. And not to be confused, we have Assistant Principal Matt Campbell. So we have uh, our two Campbell administrators. And they're an excellent team supporting your students here. I also want to thank Ward 1 School Committee man, uh, Tom Minicello, who is my vice chair on the school committee. This is his ward. And thank you again for, for hosting our first forum this year. I have Judy Sullivan, uh, my Ward 5 school committee person, again, has been with us for a long time. And I want to thank, I think they're the only two school committee members presently here. And you'll hear me talk a little bit about tonight, the hours that go into being a, a dedicated school committee person representing the whole city and making sure, especially during certainly these five years that I have been superintendent, uh, they have um, certainly risen to the challenge. I thank them for their support. Um, it's thoughtful. Um, we don't always agree, but we have uh, excellent communication and we're able to get a lot done. So, um, you know, welcome to everybody for being here this evening. I do have, like I said, I'm going to try to limit my conversation because you're out here tonight because you have things you want to ask me or things you want to hear about in the school district. One of the things uh, you heard me talk about right away was your school committee. And I want to thank all the elected officials. When I came on board, one of the things I thought was very important was there had to be dialogue. And it couldn't just be a budget time that I go before the city council. And I want to assure you that what I do all year long is to make sure at any given time, whether it's technology, whether it's talking about the budget, whether it's talking about the facilities, that we also hold our city council accountable. And we go before them whenever we're asked. You know, and many of you, I'm sure, have watched on TV and hopefully have seen the dialogue, most recently the dialogue about our budget and the continuing challenges that we have faced just to open the doors this past September. So I will continue to do that. They have been excellent partners. I want to thank City Council President Bob Sullivan and all of our city councilors. It doesn't matter when I call. They're always available and they're always supportive in every way that they can. I work closely with the mayor. So the mayor oversees um, the city and the support for the budget. And again, I will say very publicly, you'll hear me talk about it tonight, this has been nothing short of challenging. I'm not pleased that I stand before you having opened schools this past September with a $16 million budget deficit. And I told the city council when I spoke before them the other evening that I actually got a call from a superintendent in another district probably around August who was looking at facing not a $16 million deficit, but a large deficit this year. And what he said to me was, you know, can you sit down with me? Can you go over with me how you worked the budget? How did you actually get to the point you're at? And while I certainly am a good colleague and I will sit down with that superintendent, that is not what I want to be known as, as the superintendent that is able to work a $16 million budget deficit. You know, certainly that's not what we want for any of our kids. We can also do a whole lot better around here. When you talk about advocacy, so little did I realize that dealing with a $16 million budget deficit was going to mean that this was not something that can just remain in our school district, and here's what I'm saying. If you look at almost every surrounding town, I don't care if it's Easton, East Bridgewater, you know, West Bridgewater, right now I'm getting notes from superintendents that, that are very good colleagues of mine throughout the South Shore. We have what we call the superintendent's round table on the South Shore. 
who share things such as concerns about weather, concerns about some of the, the mandates from the state. And right now, they're already looking at their budgets, and here's their discussions. Well, we're looking at about a 3.5 increase in our budget next year. That's what we're going to go to the town council. And for the most part, they get that increase in their budget. What does that increase pay for? It pays for salaries that have increased, cost of living. It pays for um, inflation. It pays for the cost of health care. It pays for buying the books that have gone up. It pays for technology. And they are already looking at their budgets and what those increases will be. They're already getting ready in January and February to start to hire their teachers for next year. They're looking at a stable population and they're making decisions if they need a new first grade teacher, or if they need additional classes for their students. They're already making decisions about technology and one-to-one -one devices as we all get ready for the new MCAS 2.0 that is coming on board this year. That concerns me because for the past five years, what we have done is we are watching because we're very dependent on state funding. About 80% of our funding comes from the state. It is called the foundation formula. And I know that this community understands that formula because I've talked about it so often. So when you talk about 80%, every district is a little bit different. And I'm going to use the town of Easton right now as an example. They have a certain formula based on their poverty, based on the needs of their district, um, based on the number of English language learners, special education students. So the state looks at a town like that and it probably says, Easton, you can pay probably 70% out of your town funding. And the state will pay another 30%. Now once the state gives them 30%, the town puts in their 70%. That's called reaching foundation at 100%. Many of the towns, almost all of the towns around this state, towns and cities, then have a choice of putting additional money in. It's calling going above the foundation budget. Brockton ranks almost dead last out of 300 school districts on adding any additional money beyond foundation. And I'll explain Brockton's foundation. If you don't reach foundation, you get penalized. So if the city of Brockton is told it has to pay 20% because the state is paying 80, if it doesn't reach that 20% on the part of Brockton, Brockton could lose out on that 80%. So they make sure that they meet foundation, but there isn't any money above foundation. So when you're talking about us competing with the Eastons and the Boston, and although you think Boston is a poor city, it has many challenges. They have a lot of foundations. They're rich in real estate. You know, they have a lot of additional funding. So while they face deficits, they don't face the same deficits that we, as a struggling city looking to bring in business, looking to try to go above foundation so we can give our children the things they need to give. We are at a point now, and you've heard me talking about it, and I'll say I've talked about it for three years, and some of you are probably going to say, we're sick of hearing you talk about this. But it needed to come to this point. We right now are in an equity and education lawsuit, and we honestly, and the reason Brockton has talked about it, 25 years ago in 1993, when Ed Reform and this formula came in, and we were thrilled as a city when the state finally had to pay a share, the city had to pay a share, and we had proper funding for our children. Because before that, you had the McDuffie case that came out of Brockton. And it was a young girl named Jamie McDuffie. She was sitting in the elementary, the middle school, and the high school during her, obviously, her time here. And she was in, if you look at that law case, she was sitting in classes of 38 kids in a social studies class at Brockton High. Not enough desks in the room, not enough books for the children to have, and that was the historical McDuffie case that was going through the court system for probably 10 years. There had even been a plaintiff before Jamie McDuffie who graduated, and you have to name a sitting student. So when that case finally came up in 1993, the state was looking at a broken formula and finally brought in Ed Reform 25 years ago. So we had the lead plaintiff. Brockton was a big part of making a change, and we were in, during those 90s, the 1990s, 
we started to have class sizes that were re reasonable. We were buying technology. We had all kinds of grants. We were buying curriculum. How many remember, and this is how long I've been here, we had after school programs in every single school in this district. We had academic support programs on Saturdays, summer programs that had 3,000 kids getting additional support. That's what brought along a difference. And then what did you see happen? You saw Brockton High being written up everywhere for being a high school that transformed, that had kids being very successful, that were out there getting accepted to excellent colleges, had a, a way of you equalize their educational opportunities for those children coming from very wealthy districts. It made a difference. The formula is once again broken. We have been out there since my first year as superintendent because the state is looking at the foundation formula. We've been out there with my uh, budget manager, with city uh, school committee members, and we have been talking about this formula being broken. We have been at the state house, and I keep pointing over there to Tom and Judy. Tom has accompanied me with the Secretary of Education. Uh, we have had conversations talking about the uh, inequity for our children in Brockton. Well, here's where we are today. So with all of that advocacy, we last week brought together parents with our attorney, Sarah Catniani Spadafore, and our attorney who represents our school district, one of our attorneys, met with those parents to talk about what does it mean if your child is named the lead plaintiff. Because we need families willing to come out and say, I'm willing to put my little second grader up because that name will be out there. You hear me talking about the McDuffie case. Jamie McDuffie is now a uh, coach and a teacher over at the Kennedy School. I don't dare say her age, but she's a young woman. So you understand that this is something that could stay with you for a long time. We are also meeting, I'm talking to Stonehill College right now, about a setting in January to invite other urban districts in from out throughout the state, along with their school committee members, their mayors, to talk about joining us in this equity and education lawsuit. So that is moving along quickly. The only problem with that, it's moving along quickly in order to file the complaint. It goes through the courts at a snail's pace. So that can't be the only thing that we're looking at. I'm a taxpayer like all of you. I've lived in Brockton for over 35 years, brought my children up here. And the reason I say that is none of us want to pay additional money in taxes. We're putting kids through school. We're doing all the things that families need to do in order to have a better life for ourselves and our children. But if it comes to looking at a Prop 2.5 override, and I understand or a debt exclusion, I understand that's not popular, but I'm telling you that right now in front of us, I have ninth graders, over 1,200 of them that are sitting at Brockton High. In one year, they are going to take the new MCAS test. It's called MCAS 2.0. And it is all online. Now, many of you sitting in front of me, I'm sure, have devices at home. Computers, laptops, you know, iPods, iPads, all of the things that kids use nowadays, iPhones. I mean, we can get information pretty much anywhere. But the one thing that we want when I talk about a Prop 2.5 override is every one of our children, starting from the time that they are in preschool or certainly kindergarten, should have a laptop assigned to them and that is called a one-to-one -one device that is with them all day long. So our teachers are teaching everything from typing skills, how to work with the mouse, how to answer, because if you're taking a high-stakes testing, and our students have done very well, I always hear coming from an urban district, we defy our demographics. Sometimes I'm bothered when it says that, because I see those very bright children up at Brockton High School that are going on to great colleges, that are certainly being very successful. So my concern for all of us when I talk about a Prop 2.5 override is we have to start to find better ways to get technology into the hands of our students and our teachers and make sure that we're not continuing to cut that technology budget because we have a $16 million deficit. Sorry, I just want to check off my areas here. So now let me talk a little bit about the school district. I talked about the $16 million deficit. I can get into more detail if you want, but let me talk about what our district looks like. We have close to 3,700 employees in the Brockton Public Schools. We are the largest employer. And it was very difficult this year. I opened up school, and you invite the teachers in on opening day. 
And when you come into the auditorium at Brockton High School, there are 1,400 teachers that come for the superintendent's opening address. The address is usually about the strategic plan, what we're doing as a district, and this year it had to be very different. Because when I opened up on opening day, we did everything we could to look for money to continue to come in, to look for money from the state, to look for money through grants, from Title I funding, all of this money that supports our $220 million budget. But we started with 80 less teachers this year. 80, 80 less teachers. We lost administrators, we lost paraprofessionals, we lost monitor teacher assistants, we lost school adjustment counselors, we lost custodians, we lost administrative assistants. We were the only department in the city of Brockton to lose employees. And we lost close to 300 employees that in June, when school ended, they were there to support our youngsters. So when we lost 80 teachers, I opened the school year with 80 yellow ribbons throughout Brockton High School on those chairs when the teachers came in. Because I wanted the remaining teachers to understand the significance of having lost that many professional staff members along with all the support staff that I also just talked to you about. Because this year was going to be difficult. Class size was going to be larger in some pockets than in other places. There was going to be extra required of every single one of us. And I had to assure them that we were going to work together. And I want you to hear what I said to the principals. I wanted every teacher to walk in every day and it doesn't matter if it's the superintendent or whoever it is, and to walk up to your principal and say, how can I help today? Can I help out in the cafeteria? Do you need some extra hands on the playground? Do you need somebody running the school dances? Do you need me to help out with the uh, parent uh, PTAs? What do you need me to do? Because I worked in Brockton during those kinds of times. Back in the 80s, times were very difficult. And I was one of those teachers that made sure when I walked in, I asked the principal what I could do. And all these years later, it makes a difference for every single one of us, or for those kids that still come up to you and talk about what a great experience that they had in school. Because I don't want children to understand a senior at the high school doesn't want to hear that we have a deficit. They want to get into good colleges, they want to get good jobs, and they don't need to deal with that at this age. We, as adults in this population, need to deal with how we support our youngsters. So let me go on to when I talk about our school district. We have over 27 facilities, and some of that includes, many of you might not realize this, you're probably here with youngsters at the middle school, the elementary, our high school. We have six alternative schools. So our children have opportunities. If they don't make it at Brockton High School, which has 4,200 youngsters in it, probably the biggest high school still east of the Mississippi, you know, many kids do very well there. We graduated 1,000 kids this past June, and that did include a number of our alternative settings. So I always feel there is never a reason for a child to drop out. There is always an opportunity for every one of our children. We also have an adult learning center. Most of the money, there's some money from our city, but also from the state for learning for adults, uh, English language, for getting citizenship, and uh, for also getting what's called HISET, which used to be the GED diplomas. And those funds have also been cut, but we still are hanging on with an adult learning center program. We have special education programs throughout the district. We have a number of bilingual programs. And if you look at our bilingual programs, there has been some changes in the state law as far as how we educate our bilingual youngsters. And one of the things they did in a recent article was talk about our bilingual department and what an excellent job we have done with flexibility, with taking every student that comes on board, making sure they have the proper setting, the right classes, and eventually, over time, you see those students graduating sometimes in, in our very top positions. I actually see our director out there, Kelly Jones. Her staff is throughout here this evening. You don't hear them, but they are talking to many of our parents, and I thank them for coming out, that are not English speakers at this time, are very involved in their children's education, and want to be very much a part of our Brockton community. So thank you to, to everybody helping out here this evening. And I know we'll help with, with certainly the questions. You also have a school committee that has made sure, when I talk about your children not feeling the pinch, that has made sure that you have athletics. You have athletics. It is reduced at your middle schools. We have brought in a hybrid program so the kids can have after school in some sports, 
but your high school, you did not cut one program from that high school. It has hockey, it has football, it has soccer, it has field hockey, it has track, it has wrestling, it has basketball. I can go through every one of them. Cheerleaders, halftime dancers, because your school committee was committed that the children would have those opportunities to go on their resumes or to look back five years, 10 years, 20 years, and talk about their involvement, certainly in their time at Brockton High School. You have an, uh, a state uh, championship soccer team, which we're so proud of uh, throughout the district. Uh, wonderful young men, and these are the kind of opportunities we want for all your children. I just got word today, your drama club also, which wins awards all year long, just won uh, an award with a group of team members from the drama club. Your music awards, uh, Mr. Macrina, uh, Mr. Cunningham with your chorus. If any of you have an opportunity at the Pops concert that is coming up in about one show a week to celebrate the holiday season. All of these things are things you did not cut as a district and somehow we're managing to keep all of those things going so the kids have whatever they're involved in. We did have to cut some clubs, but we made sure that the clubs that are well attended, the kids still have opportunity for student government um, and, and a lot of the clubs that, that they enjoy <coughs> at high school. Unfortunately, if I'm being honest with you, our middle school was uh, the area that we cut a lot of the activities from. I know the school committee just approved about another $2,500 to be given to each of our middle schools so they could take a look at some of the activities that the children and the principals will make decision uh, by virtue of the numbers uh, of children that will participate in, in any particular activity. Uh, we also um, have, if you, this is something I'm, I'm really proud of. Having been an adjustment counselor in the district, you know, I understood sometimes, and this, this does not necessarily have anything to do with, with families that are low income. I know that as a parent, a working parent, trying to run my kids to school in the morning, that many times we ran out of the house and God knows if I even got a breakfast in them. So the reason I bring that up is throughout our district, and I feel very good about this, you have breakfast in the classroom for every one of your students from the kindergarten is straight through middle school and at the high school we have all kinds of opportunities for the kids when they get in there to actually have breakfast. I don't care if you're the wealthiest family, I don't care if you're a struggling family, everybody can send their child and it's a nutritional breakfast, it gives them a little bit of a snack afterwards. We have universal lunches throughout the district so you don't have children with lunch tickets. Everybody gets a lunch you know, if they want and that is throughout our district. So we've made great advances in making sure that all children, and we have seen less visits to the nurse. We haven't seen kids with hungry bellies that are growling and not being able to pay attention to the academics that are in front of them. So that has been a real plus for us. If you go up to the high school, and I said this when I was at the NAACP meeting, how many call it the new high school still? I'm probably dating myself. So when I was around, it was the new high school. I was actually in high school when the high school opened up. I didn't attend Brockton High, but it was the new high school at the time. So all these years later, I get frustrated when anyone calls it that. It's about a 48-year-old school. And it's, we do have, and I want to thank the mayor and the city council, because a couple of years ago, they put aside money to do a citywide facility master plan. So they do have in front of them some recommendations as to what we do with older buildings, what do we do with a high school that is pretty much needs to be updated? And some of the things that you'll see come out in the next 10 years, and some of you might have little kindergartners or first grade is starting, and this makes a difference with you, is to build a STEM wing onto that high school. And when you build a STEM wing that's state of the art, you can then move a house out at a time and renovate your existing high school to the point that within five years of starting construction, you can open up and have a completely renovated uh, brand new STEM building and renovated high school that will be state of the art. And make no mistake, I want you to think of a town again around you right now. Doesn't matter if it's Stoughton, Middleborough, um, Easton, uh, Abington just opened up, Holbrook is opening up, every one of them is building a new high school. So you as a city need to make sure, and like I said, I'm pleased there is a facility master plan with recommendations for how we move forward so that our kids have state of the art. But you go to the high school right now, we do have some wonderful STEM labs up there, biotech labs. You opened up a planetarium last year. A lot of this with grant money. We continue to be out there, and as I've seen a lot of the grant money not be 
as plentiful as it was when I told you years ago. We had, we had so many grants in one of the jobs I was in in community schools, we didn't know how to spend it. We had you know, money for weekend trips for families and all kinds of programs. So I'm sure at some point the pendulum will swing the other way and we will see grants. I'm not sure right now if the tenor of this country is for us to see that. But eventually we will and Brockton will certainly be ready to make sure our children are at the forefront. Um, the other thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that we involve businesses because when you don't have money, one of the things, and if you came in, I believe our communications director, Michelle Bolton, has sheets down there. I have spent the summer being out talking to CEOs in our city, talking about ways that they can come in and volunteer. I don't want to always ask for a check, but are there ways that they can adopt schools? So I'm not sure if there are business owners out here, but you, like me, I'm sure shop in the city. I'm sure you go to dry cleaners. I'm sure you have landscapers. I'm sure you have people that do work around your house that own businesses in our city. We are simply asking for people to come on board and you can do something as simple. I was talking to one of the CEOs and he said to me that he had worked in Dallas and they were very close to a school and they were a large hospital. And they had the workers go over to the local school and they were helping out in the classrooms volunteering. They were doing some of the outside work to make sure the school looked nice. So there are ways, it doesn't always have to be a dollar, it can be allowing workers to be volunteers, or it can be a simple donation to our Brockton Education Foundation. We are looking to find people, whether it's former alumni getting on board and supporting, maybe you were a great football player and you've done really well in life. You know, how about donating back so we can make sure we continue to have sports programs for our students. So these are the kind of things, if there are people out there you know, please take one of the slips and get back to us. As I am speaking before the chamber, I believe January or February, and I will be making that plea to all of the businesses to see if they will adopt a school. And let me finish up by a major change, because I want you to understand that when we had a kindergarten age in Brockton, and this goes back many years ago, we had half-day kindergarten at the time. And we had an October 31st cutoff date. So in other words, you had to be five by October 31st. Times have changed. The requirements of a full day kindergartner versus what we expect for preschool have changed over the years. What is expected of a kindergartner is not something developmentally that a four year old can handle. So we have made a decision that starting next year, and if you look at any town around you, any one of them, their start date for kindergarten is five by September 1st. So we're not going to do that right away, but this year we are going to pull that age back to November 1st. And the year after that, the kindergartners will have to be five by September 1st. And we want this to strengthen their opportunities. Because when you think about it, we were thinking about the little kids, and I understand families that have been looking forward to, we all get excited about kids starting school. And believe me, we want the children starting school. So we have a couple of things going on, but if you think about middle schoolers, it is not a good thing to have a very young middle schooler, a nine-year-old middle schooler. And when I talked to the principal at the high school, and she said to me at the time, and now we have Dr. Maria Sharon Walder before him, they said to me, can you imagine a 13-year-old starting at our high school with 4,200 kids? And if you were a December baby, you would have started at 13 years old. You wouldn't turn 14 till December. So that's a concern for the district. For those families out there that might have those, I call them burr babies, September, October, November, December. That's why they're the burr babies. We are doing preschool next year and we will target, it'll be a half day program, but we will target that group that we lose from November to December. And we'll grow our preschool program to be able to offer that you know, to our students in the district who we very much want to have in programs that benefit them but not challenge them to the point that they cannot be successful. So those are some of the things happening in the district. Um, I'm going to open it up now uh, for questions. I'm not sure if we have a format or a microphone that we can share because this is being taped. When you ask a question, could you please introduce yourself and at least let me know where your children are in the district. There might be some things also. Um, 
I'll have you bring it to whoever wants to talk. How's that? I'll stay here. Um, if you could, um, we do have somebody, I have my communications director that will be taking notes. So if there are things I can't answer, I will try to figure out a way to get a message out to parents if there are things that I need to get information out to you. So um, can I open it up for questions? Uh, gentleman down the back. No. No, and the reason for that is a date is a date for school starting. You're going to have very bright children that were born on December 31st. I understand that. But we have dates that we're, again, we looked into it research-wise. Um, a lot of it bears out. So in order to be fair, we will have November 1st, but we will have a half-day preschool program. So you'll have an opportunity to sign your child up. I'm not sure if you have another daycare provider or community provider. So half the day would be spent uh, in the Brockton Public Schools as that four-year-old next year. And then they would be able to start kindergarten fully in a full-day program the next year. Well, you know what, we can have very bright children, and what we're also finding is socially and emotionally some of, uh, again, their developmental ages do not make them good candidates for a full-day program. We did a lot of research. We presented it to the school committee last January during a meeting. We looked at standards. We looked at, again, uh, developmentally, how long a child can sit, what is their attention span, how are they socially. Um, you know, could be a lot of children we find the numbers that we have of children we're retaining in kindergarten age are a lot of those very, very young students from September to December. Is it possible that more parent engagement was done if I work with my child at an early age that over a period of time the kids be more ready to do that? I'm certainly you could. I mean, all of you can probably tell me, some of you probably have kids reading at, you know, four years old. They're looking at words. I understand all of that. But a school system has to follow a set of guidelines that we think will benefit those children. And like the other 300 districts in the state, we've looked at the research and have decided that September 1st, eventually, it is going to take us two years to get there. Next year will be November 1st, so they have to be five by November 1st. And the year after that, they will have to be five by September 1st. And that will be our date as a district. Well, the deficit, first of all, came from uh, throughout all of the groups that I just told you were raises involved. Um, we have 1,400 teachers um, and all of the other professionals, and that was probably about $8 million. We also had lost about $6 million in what we called economically disadvantaged. So there was additional money that came into the district. Previously, it was about 81% of our students that qualified for free and reduced lunch and it brought additional money in to support those youngsters. At the time, we had, I want to say, well over 9,000 students that qualified 
and with something called direct certification. So if you were a family that was on some kind of an assistance, they looked at you as a, a family that was low income. We have many more families in Brockton that aren't necessarily on public assistance, but qualify as low income, and they fell off. So we had, uh, there's a number of things. There was health insurance, retiree health insurance that we used to, the city used to claim, and now it's the school department. I have the list if you'd like to look at it. But $16 million was uh, health care insurance uh, went up. It was like another 4% um, out of uh, students that go out to a charter or out to school choice. Uh, there was another, I think, $4 million. So there was, and you know what? I, I'm not going to get into a charter debate this evening, but I will quote the acting commissioner of education. And because that's a formula. And, and you know what? I'm all for parents choosing where they want their children to go to. But what I'm not all for is, and I'm going to explain this very quickly, is we get a per pupil rate for every child we have. It's a blended rate. It looks at special needs children. It looks at bilingual children. It looks at poverty. It looks at general ed students. And our amount is a little over $12,000 per student. And every October 1st, we have to tell the state how many students we have so they can put in their 80%. And that every district is different. Ours is about $12,000. When a charter school moves in, they're not taking that bilingual student. They're not taking the special education student. And for the most part, they're not taking students that have any kind of social, emotional need. I can go on and on. And those students cost you about 7,500 to educate. They're kind of your general education students. And yet they get the $12,000 per student. So that has hurt us, and we're still left with many of, the, obviously all of the students, and, and believe me, you know, we, we want to educate every student. That's what we are. We're a public school district. That's a broken formula. It's something that the state has been looking at for years, but there's a lot of money that follows your charter schools. Lots of money. Lots of advocacy groups. And in Massachusetts, you're number one in the country for your public school system. I don't know if you know that. So you have the best public schools in the country. We, although we have a charter here in Brockton, we don't feel the pinch as much but that hurt us last year. It was the first year of the charter coming in, and that hurt us for another couple of million dollars. So it added up to exactly $16 million. We looked through for a superintendent with a budget of $220 million. For me to be telling you I know how many ink cartridges are in the district is ridiculous. But that's how many things we looked at, and nobody's happy. I heard people say, cut more administrators, cut, cut more of this. We're doing everything we can, and my goal, and I said this to the school committee, and I can't tell you how many hours they met. So when, when we want to be critical of, and we all are, believe me, you know, I can be critical of, of my political elected officials. But the one thing that I'm going to tell you is they spent hours and hours, starting last January and even before, and are now even looking at your next year's budget, looking at what can we do, you know, how can we find a balance. So I didn't want to, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater. I had to look at everything. That's why I talked to you tonight about extracurricula, about our classroom sizes. Some of them are a little higher than I would like, depending on the level. I definitely have some classes at the high school that have 37 and 36 kids in some of the social studies or math classes. Um, there are less amounts at the middle school somehow, and we cut at the middle school. You saw the things we cut. But the class sizes are a little bit better. I did have pockets. For instance, the first day of school, I went to North Middle School, and I had 43 kids sitting in a cafeteria at North with a health teacher. We immediately went in and brought in an additional. So every time I, we find any kind of additional money in the budget, we're looking at our class sizes or how we can continue to support. We had kindergartens that used to have a para in every kindergarten, a paraprofessional. So you have one teacher with 25 youngsters, or even more in some of our schools, and I want all of us to think about four and five year olds, and imagine what that is like. And we did not have enough paraprofessionals. We ended up giving every school about seven or eight paraprofessionals and said you're gonna to have to share them. So these are not the situations that I told you I don't want your children to realize it are these kinds of situations. It certainly made for a much safer environment and a better environment when we had kindergarten classes that were reasonable. And I'll never forget a superintendent in a neighboring town 
saying to me, well, I look at my budget, and then if I need to, I might have to add, if I find it getting really tight, I might have to add another child or two and do away with, let's say, a kindergarten teacher. But their numbers were 15 and 16 in a class of kindergarten youngsters. You have some schools, you go to the Kennedy School, any of you that are out there, I think Hancock is another one. Your numbers are 25, 26, 27 in kindergarten classes. I'm at the Downey School and the numbers are a little bit more reasonable. And that has to do with busing. It's all tied in together. You know, it has to do with, with I wish we could separate children evenly and have a balance in the classes, but the way that our houses are, the sizes of our schools, it's just not doable the way that you would think. Somebody said to me last year, well, again, just, you know, close the, um, the classes when they get too large. We've done that. And we try to force parents that are coming in a little bit later. They don't have maybe, they could move into the Hancock School neighborhood and there's not a seat there. But then we have to find a place that has a bus or a place where the child can go. And our busing was also at a deficit this year. Uh, the mayor is hopefully going to appropriate another, I think, close to $300,000. That's just to get us through the rest of the year. So we did not touch your busing this year, even though, and that's the city's responsibility. That is not the school's. That is called non-net school spending, and the city has to decide about the busing. That's not something your school committee can decide. That's not something the superintendent can decide. That's the mayor, and that's the city council. So my name is Francis. I have a child at the Baker School. So the negative impact of the budget allocation this year, how do you anticipate it's going to affect next year and the coming years? Yeah. And uh, secondly, on the education equity lawsuit, what are your what are the odds that this is going to Well, let me do the education lawsuit first. So you're asking me the odds. I can't tell you what the odds are other than I will tell you I was speaking before the Senate this summer on July 25th, myself and our budget manager, Aldo Petronio, on a bill called Senate Bill 223, I think it is. And I told you that there was meetings going on when I became superintendent about looking at the foundation formula. That formula is broken. And when I went to, to speak before them, I spoke about finally implementing some of the recommendations on fixing the broken formula. The best thing that happened to me before I spoke was a former Secretary of Education, Paul Revel, who was there and spoke before any of us did and looked at the Senate and the House, it's actually a joint committee, and said, you have done all the groundwork and you're basically saying the formula is broken. I'm surprised nobody has filed an equity and education lawsuit. So I like that he said that, and we are going to bring other districts together, and I guarantee you before the end of this school year, if not sooner, we will file. I just think it's a long process. My hope is that they will go in and finally look at that foundation budget review recommendation, which is more money for special education students, more money for English language learners in poverty. That will help our district if they do that. You asked about what our projection is. So we already are meeting with the, and I keep pointing over here to my school committee members, we're already meeting to look at the project, projection next year. It's not 16 million because we've already balanced out the district as far as people that we have let go, or, you know, reduction in force. We also are in contract negotiations and as you can imagine, you know, we don't have contracts looming over us right now and we're going to have to live within our pocketbook. So we're going to do the best we can, you know, with good faith and bargaining with all our teachers, our paraprofessionals, our administrative assistants, people that make up our workforce. But the problem is obviously we're struggling and we need to run a school district first and foremost. Ryan Dragon I gotta keep kids at West, kids at the high school, but I just you saw your son. Did he just get the John and Abigail Adams, Adams yep. scholarship. Yep. Um, you had mentioned that I think it was you said maybe four million for school choice as well. What you had brought up that was lost. Why do we participate in that if we're losing money to other towns? You know what? That's part of the um, schedule 19. So we don't really lose in that case. And I'm glad you brought that up. The charter is what it is. That money goes to them regardless if they have a general ed kid that they're educating. Um, and like I said, the numbers are showing they're not taking our high needs population. If, in fact, a child chooses to go to West Bridgewater, we still get that $12,000 per pupil cost, 
and the town gets 5,000. So we still end up with 7,000 left in our coffers. The reason that works for the towns, and, and they're the ones that I'll talk to you about why that works, if they have, they're demographically losing students. We are not. An urban district has students coming in all the time from countries all over the world. That's what we're seeing in our district. A place like West Bridgewater has a pretty stable environment. They look at the birth rate, they can do a demographic study, they have an idea of what next year's classes are gonna look like in kindergarten. So if they find that they have 15 kids, let's just say, in a kindergarten, and they say, you know what? We could open up four seats in every one of our grades. That's a good chunk of change for them. That might mean they're able to keep a couple of extra sports programs. Maybe it goes to providing additional technology. And you're also getting parents, you know, they're careful about, you know, who they're accepting, you know, as far as making sure that they can meet the students' needs. So they make the decision about school choice. I don't make the decision if West Bridgewater or East Bridgewater or any of the surrounding towns are opting into school choice. We're very careful in Brockton. We take a look at, because our numbers are so large, Many times we allow it, I believe, at the high school level, and that depends on, again, our seat availability. So our school committee makes a decision every year, but I have no control over what happens in other districts. Uh, my name is Aileen. My daughter attends the Barrett Russell pre-K. Uh, this isn't a budget question. It's more of a safety concern, a big concern. Today, my daughter, when she left the Barrett Russell, we usually go to the playground outside. She went around to the slide, came over to me, and she said, Mama, look, I found a boo-boo shot. It was an actual syringe. I immediately, you know, just had her throw it down. I ran into the school. They, you know, I got hand sanitizer. I told Joanne Camillo, who's wonderful. Um, I said, what is going on? And she actually said she does as much as she can what she does, but it's the city of Brockton that's mainly responsible for that. And this was an issue before when we were at the Gilmore. I remember we attended the meeting before mm -hmm. when we were trying to transition. This was the first thing that we as parents were promised that the area would be cleaned out. There would be no syringes because there, I mean, my concern is we've asked before if it could be fenced in. I just think it's, it should be for the pre-K kids. It shouldn't allow others to come after. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they want to throw away their life, fine. I don't understand why they do it in playgrounds. There's been nip bottles, there's been cigarettes, there's been lighters. So obviously they're not cleaning it up. Well, I think, and I am aware of the situation that happened today, and it should be unacceptable to every single one of us. So what we're talking about here, and it isn't just the Barrett Russell. The reason the Barrett Russell was a concern for us was it was a school that had been dormant for a number of years, even before we brought it back on in 2013-14 as a kindergarten center. And when we did, you know, the neighborhood was a little bit different. They, you know, there weren't kids that they were worrying about. They hung out in the playground. I think it's Parmenters is the playground there. But all over the city, we have playgrounds that are pretty much are tied to schools. And unfortunately, especially in that area, and I can name a few others, we have, you know, people that are out there, you know, doing whether it's drug use, whether it's hanging out drinking, you know, I'm not sure if it's young kids, that probably is not necessarily young kids. And what we have with the city, because the city owns that particular playground, we're not talking about the fenced in playground that's behind the school that is fenced in, that we do control. It's in the front and it's in the, the city playground. So what we have with the city parks department that oversee the playground is that is supposed to be a sweep every Monday morning because there is a lot of activity on the weekends. Our custodians are supposed to also be out there making sure that a sweep happens so that we are picking up, they actually are paid additional money, picking up hypodermic needles, you know, as I said, all kinds of paraphernalia. So we did uh, immediately get on that this morning. Um, and again, I will ask the parents for your cooperation. I also will be talking to the police chief to make sure that there are patrols out there, you know, to, to see what's happening, not just because this is gonna happen in our playgrounds, but why are they allowed on that property? You know, adults in the evening don't belong on school property. So, or excuse me, city property, playground property. So um, I know we immediately had that cleaned up. I apologize and it is unsettling. And as you said, it is a safety issue. Right. Matter, you know, yep. but how in the future, I mean, they're going to say, you know, yep. okay, we should have cleaned it up. Or how are we going to do this? How are we going to take care of it in the future? Can 
I mean, I don't know if I should go directly to the city of Brockton. Oh, I, I mean, it needs to be resolved. I'm afraid to send my, you know, and my friend here yeah. also, or her yeah. son goes to the playground. We don't want this incident to happen again. Right. We don't want to have to look around. No, I, I mean, I, there's beer bottles, there's glass thrown everywhere. I, I completely agree with you. We will follow up again. It is, again, I just want to make it clear this is an excuse making. It is city property. I don't have control over the Brockton Police Department. I do have control over the school police. Okay. We have control over our custodians, our administrative staff that, that can go out and look. We've trained our custodians to make sure that they understand we want to keep them safe also. And for the most part, they've done a good job. But but it is there. You know, even if you weren't complaining about your, your own child, and like I said, unacceptable, it is out there. You go to the playgrounds, it doesn't matter if school is in session, you know, you are going to see this para paraphernalia. And I do think when we talk about all the money that we're spending on public safety, and we should, we live in a city, and we live in a city that has issues. So these are things, like I said, I do not believe that people belong in those areas. You know, why are they there? Different if you have a, a men's or women's softball league or something where adults are getting together for a beautiful summer, spring, fall evening, and we're using our playgrounds. But playgrounds are for children, and that's not acceptable. So. I will follow up. I meet with the mayor on a regular basis, and he will, I'm sure, take care of it. I know he also takes it very seriously. So, so can I, you know. talk to the city of I would contact my city councilor. Okay. Um, we will also on the school end, okay. um, and I would call the mayor's office. Okay. And again, I will have those same conversations. I'm not sure if our school committee wants to address it. I know it's something that we've certainly talked about. You know, it's it's an issue for us, and not just at the Barrett Russell. That just happened to be a place that we did come in five years ago and took over what had been a place that didn't have children around for a lot of years. And I thought we've made great gains there. It's, it's a beautiful area. Our fenced-in area is very appropriate for the children. But, um, and there used to be football meds. There were every day. I would see them, and they just stopped coming by. Okay. They would drive they, on the grass. They would drive on the grass, yeah. yeah. And they would watch while we were there, which I was very... I haven't seen them since then. No, Maybe I haven't either. Maybe they could do that again. Right. So I will follow up. Out. Thank you. Okay, I'm not. I so your your son loves soccer. Is he in middle school? Did you say? No, no, no. He's in the Hancock. He's at the Hancock School, but coming to the middle school. So uh, you're so you're asking if he has to pay? There's no pay. We have no fees. Unfortunately, we've had to cut back sports programs. The middle schools do have a hybrid sports program. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So when you're talking about paying, you're joining your own. In other words, it's like a, a, a team from Brockton Youth Soccer or something, not connected with the Brockton Public Schools. Right. So what we do assure you of is that middle school, and this is part of the budget cuts, we have some sports program for students. Each middle school makes their own decisions. And then what we have is the high school is free for everybody, freshmen, JV, varsity sports for all the sports and there's no money that they have to pay. It is free. Yep. Hi. Marvin Mohammed. I have a, um, an eighth grader at the club and a senior at the high school. And it's not a question, just a comment. I find that um, the parents are not as um, um, reached out to as much as I think that they should. Um, in both the middle school and in high school, I find that the um, the administration has the, the the thinking or the um, the policy that children should be independent. And when their um, sports um, tryout or for the seniors, actually, um, when they have um, open house for different colleges, they announce it to the to the to the students but they don't reach out to the parents so to let parents know. Um, I'm sure that by now, uh, you know, the administration at the school, even high school, should realize that some kids are very forward thinking and very involved, but some kids are not. And if parents are not involved in what's going on, 
then those kids might actually <coughs> fall behind. And um, since the parents are still, you know, responsible for the children and, you know, do need to take part in, you know, kind of giving them a little nudge in the direction of, you know, applying to colleges and stuff. It's very disconcerting when I go to, to one event and, um, and I realize, oh yeah, last week or this Saturday we had a, you know, an, uh, the, you know college so-and-so was here. I'm like, well, how, why is it that I didn't know this? With the technology that we have right now, mm -hmm. where it's so easy to reach out to parents, parents should be involved a little bit more. Okay. So let me answer frustration on my part. We have a program called Infinite Campus, which is our student management program. We've had it for nine years. And there's a part of that, not extra money, something we pay for, it's called the parent portal. So it has taken us a long time. Last year or two years ago, we did a trial at the high school. And we opened it up under student accounts because students can get into this portal also. So we are opening it up finally to every parent at Brockton High. Those of you in the middle school, we just started to actually open it up. If you went to your parent-teacher conferences, I know you had to sign up so we can make sure we're getting passwords out to parents. So we absolutely need to do a better job. We just did hire finally in the middle of a difficult budget and a lot of changes with um, how our website, not just ours, every website has to be accessible to whether you're you know, sight impaired, you know, there's got to be a way that you can access a website. So we just hired a web content manager. Today was his first day. So we're very excited about really looking at that website and making sure, I had uh, parents at the NAACP meeting complaining that we don't have things up there to talk about how to help with content and homework. You know, are there ways that we can go on a website and parents can have some kind of information to assist their youngsters? I did think the guidance department sent out a paper newsletter to everybody, to parents. I, I've seen the newsletter, so I'm not sure what happened, but it was excellent. It told you about uh, teachers last week was wear your uh, college you know, shirt or paraphernalia to talk to your students about the process. Um, you know, we have college fairs. We have how to fill out the FAFSA forms. So those things are all going on. So let me look, and if you want to give uh, the communications director your name, I'll follow up. But you're absolutely right. We could do a much better job. I hope we're doing a better job in starting to look at. So when you get your parent portal, and we will get down to the elementary. So for the elementary, although there'll be a lot of notices, it almost becomes the paperless backpack so that you're getting notifications. How many have access, or I don't want to really ask a question, but I, I'm going to guess most of you have access to the web one way or another, through an iPhone or your, your internet at home. So your middle schoolers, you're going to start to be able to see attendance. You're going to start to see grades and report cards. So it's no longer just waiting for that paper report card to come home. We'll send out a message telling you report cards are ready. You can go in with your own password as a parent and up pops your children's grades. Hopefully before that pops up, you've been able to see the assignments. Are they missing homework? Are they missing assignments? Do they have a project due? So it's taken us a lot longer than other districts. But, and you know the excuse we always used? Well, not everybody has access to the internet. And I really get fed up listening to that. So we will continue to do paper copies. We'll continue to do connected messages. And we'll make sure that we're opening up that parent portal. But I will try to get you the information and find out from the high school if we can even do a bubble on our website that gives parents, especially of students going on to college, juniors and seniors, that kind of information. Hi, my name is Melinda Brown, and I have a student at the, two students at the high school and one at the elementary. And I agree with this woman right here. I didn't get any information in regard to like college things. I just have to know. Um, so I guess my first question would be, at the high school, there's no more re paper report cards, I take it, because they're all done with that type of thing now. I know last... Well, we have, the, we have the parent and the student portal, but I think yeah. we have to provide access. If any parent requires a paper copy, we'll certainly do that. Oh, you could so... Like, yes. Oh, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I was going to say, um, my daughter was fortunate. Um, she ended up going to Brockton High when she was four, about four and a half. She graduated from Brockton High at 16. So she started college at 16. So I think 
I mean, that's pretty sad to say now, but I could see why you're changing the date. But for some kids, it does work. And some kids are able at four, four and a half <coughs> to do well. So it's unfortunate. But just to say that my daughter, like I said, she did start four, four and a half. And I, she actually started college at 16, which was pretty scary. But she did. Yeah. She did good. And she's a junior now in college. So, yeah. I mean, for some kids, it does work. Oh, absolutely. I'm sure. Yeah, some kids, yeah. Started four and a half. Well, we can. Those would have been your huh? your burr babies. Well, her I thought it was mandatory. Yeah. Yeah. That's why it didn't work for Abby. That's why they changed it. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. My son's over at the high school, and I just got a phone call from the high school saying that the report cards are out and that you have the option if you want your child to get a paper copy. Um, he can request that. Uh, he, can, he or she can you know, get the paper copy and bring it to the college. So that came out. They go to the dean's office. Or they went to the guidance counselor, and the guidance counselor said no. So. Well, that's not right. Yeah. yeah, they went today. I asked them. I said, yeah. oh, no, my guidance counselor told me I can't. So. Uh, I think it's the dean. I don't think it's the guidance counselor. I think it's the dean or the assistant dean that will give them out. Mm. Okay. If that's the case, sure. the guidance counselor should say, go right. to the dean's office. Yeah, yeah. She, she asked twice. So I'll just call them. And just to your point about the younger children, yeah. both of my sons were born in October. Yeah. Um, you know, knock on wood, they, they were fine. Right. But some of their friends that yeah. were in the same boat were a little immature. Yeah. Like, like all my friends moved out of Brock and they all went to the town. So my, when I say to my friends, oh, my son is graduating at this age, right. they look at me like, what, what do you mean? He's a junior, right? I go, no, 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 he's a senior. Right. My kids were always young. And they were always the last ones to get their licenses because yeah. all the other kids you know, in the other grades. You know, so it works for some, but I think the odds, what, what happened with the school committee is that we were presented with the data. Okay? <coughs> and there's a small segment of kids that it works for. Yeah. But in that age group, a larger segment of kids, it doesn't work for. So, so if, if the numbers were opposite, it was like, oh, all the younger kids, it works for them. Well, we would have said, well, let's keep it. But the few that it works for, there are more in that segment that they're a little more immature in another year, giving them that maturity. And then you also get some of the parents who basically say, I want my kid to stay back because I want him to play basketball or baseball or hockey or football, you know what I mean, and be you know, stronger and bigger and whatever, and they're going to get a big scholarship and be a pro or whatever. But you know, that's another thing altogether. But the data that the school committee looked at, the overall data showed that, yeah, some kids this amount it worked for, but the vast majority, it was clear that we were the only really city in the state that does it this way, especially in this area, this whole South Shore. So, you know, it, if you take, what we have to do with the school committee is take the best interest of the majority of kids, you know what I mean? So, for the majority of that age group, you couldn't argue with the numbers in terms of how their grades were, how they were scoring in MCAS compared to kids that are a little bit older, mature. So, did you do studies over the last couple of years? Though? Well, we were presented yes. with all the materials. You know, that, that we don't do the studies. We we're, we're presented with the study materials of the educators that have done the studies. You know what I mean? So we review the expert. You know what I mean? So whatever. But that's just to give you an idea. Yeah. But yeah, you should get the report card if you want. Just have them go to the house. What building, is, what building is your town? Azure. Oh yeah, go, just go to the house dean's office. And okay. Say, I, I want, my mother wants paper report card. Okay. Better yet, sign up for the parent portal. I do, I am, and I did see it on my Make sure you can go right on and get that report card. Like and don't think for a minute. So <laughs> my daughter, my first daughter started college. She went to the University of New Hampshire, and she was fortunate to be an honor student. and. But she was smarter than that. She wasn't going to sign up for that because that would have been a lot of extra work. So September came, we sent her away, packed her away, and I got on the phone to call the University of New Hampshire. Now, we were paying the bills. Do you think they would talk to me? Of course not. Absolutely not. So 18 years old, you can pay every one of those bills, but you have no say in what they're doing. So enjoy it now while you do have a say. Since you just brought that up, what happens with that? It does, so under your, there are a lot of changes. They, no, they, 
they can sign themselves out of school. They're legal. They could say, you know, um, I, I'm taking a half day today. I have a doctor's appointment, and they can dismiss themselves at 18. Um, they also can see their records. There's all kinds of things that change. They become, if they decide nobody else can see their records but them at 18, that's a decision that they can make. And those are, those are not Brockton Public School laws. Those are federal laws with student records. But even, even if they, they sign something that says that parents can talk to them, because I know it's going to be the same problem with doctors and stuff like that, too. It's right. It's called the FERPA waiver. Yeah. What is it? It's a FERPA, that's B R P A. Um, at college orientations, we distribute it to the students, and if the students want to give their parents permission, some of them do it because their parents are right there at orientation with them, and they're like, you will do this. Otherwise, as a college faculty member, I am prohibited from this. It doesn't matter. By law, I am prohibited as a, fa as, as a college faculty member from giving any parent any information about a child, including grades, um, grades on specific assignments, Attendance. health health issues, absences, uh, judicial things, but for an 18 year old, there are documents that can be signed and the FERPA waiver covers them even if they're 18 in high school. And you can talk to your child and ask them, you know, if, if they'll sign it for you. I know some parents force their kids to sign it and then when they come back as sophomores, they refuse. <laughs> You'll be fine. <laughs> Michael? Yeah, my name is Michael, and uh, I'm a parent of the George School. And I uh, wanted to talk to uh, at the George School is the Emerging Program. So I wanted to see, hear about a little bit more what's happening with the Emerging Programs. And then also, a second question is you know, you talked about some of the issues that we're having here in the school department, but what can we do as parents to help out on our end to help support? Okay. Let me answer that first. So I had the principals at a principals meeting this past Wednesday, and one of the things that we made it clear, the schools don't make it easy for anything. I can remember being a parent, and if I wanted to go on a field trip, I just said, hey, I'll sign up to go on the field trip, and I went on the field trip. Now parents have to go through quarries. If there's somebody that's responsible for kids and helping out and teaching in a classroom, you have to get fingerprints done, and none of this is inexpensive. Quarries are an obligation of the district. We are able to take care of that. Fingerprints are $35, I believe, for a non-certified person. So it's, it's, I'm not going to say it's a problem. We obviously want to keep our children safe. And you want the right people you know, with your children if you're on a field trip or somebody's in the classroom. So I clearly understand that. But I do want to encourage you, first of all, when I spoke to the principals, we've had great needs at recess. During lunches, we need volunteers. So if there are people out there that in any way, shape, or form are willing to go through that, and maybe you have, and I hate to say this to you, one day off and, and you're willing to, you know, to give some of that time to help out at your child's school, we certainly would like that. I know the PAC, and Michael, I know how involved you are, and, and many of you probably are from, get involved. You know, when you talk about having a voice, get involved in the PACs. Make sure that you know, you're hearing what's happening in your child's school. You also have school councils. By law, every one of your school has a school improvement plan that has to be approved by the superintendent. So we have a district improvement plan, and we have school improvement plans to make sure we're holding your principals accountable for the education of the youngsters under their care. And every one of those needs at least a parent or two as part of that school council. So make sure you're out doing those things. Michael, the other part of your question um, was about the, uh, you're talking about the uh, Spanish, the two-way Spanish program. So the good news we have is we started this, Kelly, how many years ago with the Spanish two-way? About 14. I was going to say, we've graduated kids that have actually gone through the program. This is a very uh, highly sought-after program. Research shows that it makes for a better student academically. Uh, I can speak one language. I would love to have learned a second language. So that's a wonderful opportunity, not only for our Spanish-speaking families, new children coming to the country, learning English, but also our English-speaking students and families to have the involvement with Spanish. Two years ago, we brought in a Portuguese uh, program at the Raymond School. We now have our first, grade. first graders, kindergarten and first grade, two years. And next year, we're going to finally bring on our French immersion program. 
So we're very excited. We haven't named the program yet. We uh, have, you know, certainly uh, talked to our school committee. We're going to be looking at that program. We're looking at a location. Uh, we're possibly looking at the Baker School, which already has a strand of um, our Haitian French Creole youngsters there. So we have a lot of our counselors that are there or our support staff there. So we thought with times being as tough as they are budget-wise, I don't want to hold back on that program. Our goal was actually to have an international school, and eventually I think you'll see in the next five years we will have an international school in Brockton for Spanish, two-way Spanish, for uh, Portuguese, and for French. So we're very excited to be able to bring that to the community. Does that answer your question? Hi, I'm Jeffrey. Uh, you, you, you talked about uh, uh, one disturbing aspect about losing about eight teachers. Eight, 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 zero, eight teachers. Eight, eight. teachers. Eight. So did you ascertain why they went away? And um, if so, uh, uh, what are you doing to stop this episode? OK, I didn't explain that correctly to you. So when I told you that 80 teachers left did not come back it wasn't because they didn't want to we don't lose teachers for the most part in the Brockton public schools although we're starting to because they're starting to lose faith in us being able to keep our teachers when I tell you I've been here 41 years this district offered me every opportunity when I got advanced degrees to be able to come back and you know to be able to use my degree those 80 teachers go on what's called a recall list and they wait to be called back. Sometimes other districts take them, but not because they don't want to be here. We did not have the money. So when you have a $16 million deficit, you look at everything from supplies and materials, and that's why I said to you, I know every single ink cartridge we have are looking at efficiencies. But in the end, the most costly thing you have are your personnel. And what we did was we did a percentage across the board. That's why you saw it affected paraprofessionals and monitor teacher assistants and custodians and school police and administrators. But the vast majority, I have 1,400 teachers. So those 80 teachers were let go because of funding, not because they wanted to leave. Um, just going along with the discussion, Marlon will come in um, at the Fulton High School. Uh, with the Spanish, um, with the Spanish thing, I've always found both of my kids went to the Plouffe, and they were in the the PEP program with the um, with the Chinese. And I've always felt as though it would have served them better to have Spanish and focus on Spanish and try to maybe because that's such a predominant language. It seems as though it would just make more sense. Yeah. Has that been discussed? The decision to go with Chinese, you you actually had a superintendent who I believe was born in China, mainland China, uh, Buzz Nimbrakow at the time back in I want to say 2007 or eight. And he had studied uh, certainly what, it, what difference it made for a child's education. And they were talking about opportunities for international, for business, and that's why Chinese was brought in. We have many parents, and your school committee members will tell you, for those parents whose students go through the PLUF school and the IB program, go up to the high school, and we struggle sometimes to find Chinese teachers. So that has been something that the school committee has held on to. Um, and it's something that, at the present time, we'll continue to, to offer. But that doesn't mean we don't offer Spanish or French. There are other languages that we offer. What I'm saying is that it could be, it could be an elective as opposed to a requirement in the, you know? In the IB program? Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, It just makes more sense to... Um, yeah, I don't believe Chinese is required for IB, but a world language is. And I'm, I'm good. Kelly, I don't know if you know, is Spanish considered? I would consider that a world language. Yeah, it is considered a world language, but I, I, I think it's a, it's a question right now what resources are available and how to schedule it. So I think at the, the, at the plus, they have the choice of, of Chinese as their world language. The, um, the two-way students do have Spanish. Spanish. So two-way, and I'll talk about it in Spanish, so you bring in a class of kindergartners or first graders, 
and half of the class are Spanish-speaking students. Maybe in their home, Spanish is the dominant language. The other students are English-speaking. So they come together and learn together. Part of the day, they're learning in English, and part of the day, they're learning in Spanish. So when they're very young, they actually come away with, after 12 years, they're speaking both languages fluently. So is that offered in one school? That... We have it offered at the George School. So when they come in as kindergartners, and at the Raymond, we just uh, a couple of years ago brought in the Portuguese. And next year, possibly at the Baker, we'll bring in the French uh, two-way program. Mm -hmm. Can I just say that my daughter's a junior at the Brock County, and she's been in it since kindergarten at the George, and it's a wonderful program. What is she speaking? Oh, I would have loved to have been part of that. What is she speaking? And we, yeah, and when she you say that we have... Yeah. Her language, but she speaks Spanish. Language? She does Spanish. Spanish? Mm -hmm. oh, that's good. But we do have limited seat enrollment. I, I'd like to say that there are some costs associated with it. We are expanding, like I said, to, to other languages. Uh, and I do hope, when you talk about an international school, if you look at one of our larger schools, they house about 900 youngsters. So I, I think down the line, you're going to see a city with all of its struggles with being very progressive. And we're very progressive because we value the, as I, I started out by telling you, I wish I spoke another language. So we make sure that our students have opportunities from very young ages to reflect the languages spoken in our community. I had parents tell me when they went to visit a friend's home and now could speak that friend's language. I mean, it made a world of difference you know, with families. So years down the line, these, you know, students settled here, you know, it's going to be, I think, a, a <clears throat> excuse me, a different community in a very positive way. It, it almost makes me feel like <clears throat> the kids who went through the, um, the IB program are at a disadvantage because they leave with a language that is very difficult for them to really have gained anything from. And when they get to the high school, it's so broken up that they, it's, they, there's no real continuity. And it would benefit them so much more to be, to, even if they can't be in this kind of a program, to have maybe Spanish from an earlier age and continue that until high school. And then they will actually have you know, a glimmer of a chance of being proficient in that language than to have a language that it's almost like they really, I have two kids that have gone through it. And, there's no what, what I will suggest you do, and I can certainly bring it back, I have two school committee members here, um, and I can certainly prepare the high school, and we can get some information to our school committee members, but it probably would be worth it for you to come before the hearing of visitors and talk to the school committee. Because interesting enough, you get the other side where, God forbid, you look to you know, eliminate a class, and one of them has been Chinese. We've looked at it, and it was not met. At one point, we looked at the IB program, we think the IB program is a great program, but there is some cost associated to it. And we'd rather offer a lot of your AP course, courses, your advanced placement courses. And we must have had how many people in the audience? 50, 60 kids coming to the microphone? None of us like to, to cut anything. I wish we could offer Chinese and offer more Spanish, but I don't know. Your children didn't have a choice as far as the Chinese or Spanish? They started it. And once they started it, it was almost like a required part. Right, you have to, you have to continue, continue it. Yeah. And although if I pushed and pulled, I could have gotten Spanish, but it wasn't so. It wasn't yeah. that easy. And I, I always felt as though Spanish would have been more sure. beneficial yeah. to them. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I think I think um, Chinese is great, but it should be more of an elective to introduce mm -hmm. the children to the. You know, to, 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 to the language, but not with an attempt to really think that they're going to be proficient in it in any sense, because that's almost like a, a you know. As I said, it's been here, uh, that's when it came in. Um, parents have fought to keep it in. It's really the first time I've ever heard that. I think if they do Spanish, it should be sort of a requirement from an early mm -hmm. age so that, you know, because Spanish is something that you have yeah. a real chance of being, mm -hmm. you know, speaking the language by the time you reach high school. Yeah. Spanish is more like a second language yeah. in this country. Yeah. Well, I think it's more of a certainly, I, I would guess that if you travel the world, Spanish is probably spoken in many countries. Yeah, you don't have to go too far. So Right. But I will say that Chinese is on the government's list as a critical language. You can make so a living off of speaking Chinese. For um, people who speak Chinese, that people who um, don't speak, who, who speak Spanish, don't have in terms of programs and scholarships and funding. Mm -hmm. What are we doing to educate the teachers? of 
difficult, SEI language, multicultural? Well, when you talk about SEI, one of the things that the teachers have had to do, I want to say going back three years now, is they have to get an endorsement. So every teacher in the Brockton Public Schools that teaches any student, a bilingual student, and that's pretty much all our teachers, have to get this endorsement. Kelly, is it 50 hours of professional development? 45 hours for the full course. So our teachers, certainly, especially in our district, you know, are getting as much training. We also have started to look at uh, when we have our some of you I'm sure I'm surprised you're not telling me how upset you are with some of the half days so I'm glad I brought that up so the reason I say that is because we have very little time for professional development it's very costly to keep teachers beyond their contractual day so a couple of years ago we finally said we need to be looking at content we have common core coming in changes for MCAS 2.0 things that we need to work with our teachers on for professional development and certainly teaching our SEI population. So, so what are we doing about that? Well, when you say teachers can't speak the language, our SEI classes have uh, coaches, we have uh, paraprofessionals to assist, but the law has clearly stated that for the most part, the students, if they're in SEI classes, are taught in English with support in the uh, content areas. Kelly, do you want to? Well, you know, we started a program last year with 15-hour um, modules for professional development for teachers. This is part of the requirement for certification. Every single teacher in the, in the district, if they're going to renew their license to become a teacher, they have to take 15 hours worth of training in English learners and 15 hours worth of training in students with disabilities. So the district's response has been to try to offer professional development for teachers. So for example, this fall, we offered one on the social emotional learning of English learners. That was one that we, op we offered. Um, we op offer ones on on um, differentiating instruction for English language. There are lots that we're offering, and we will continue to offer it because people are going to have to renew their license all the time. So, so we're offering we're offering some, and we'll continue to offer more and more and more and different ones, so that people have options of what they want to take. We're also trying to bring into the district. There are so many mandates statewide requirements so that your children do pass that MCAS 2.0 and get their high school credential. But when I first came in, one of the positions I looked at before I realized we would have such a deficit was looking at a cultural proficiency specialist to talk about all of the different cultures and so the kids can learn about their neighbors and their friends. That was a position we never brought on board, but that being said, we are looking at our curriculum. Are we offering electives? to make sure that our kids understand the rich culture that we are in as a city. So that has been an ongoing process. We've been really focused on the change to the Common Core the past couple of years, again, to make sure that was our priority. So we were teaching the standards that your children were going to have to pass to be able to get their high school credential. So we continue to struggle with that. We're doing the best we can, but we spend a lot of time offering professional development to our staff which is why you see the additional half days if you're wondering what is happening during those days. Is there somebody that hasn't had a question? I see a number of hands up. I'll get back to you. Somebody that hasn't. I was just at the Baker School, so granted we have larger than not class sizes, but, and again, when you bring up, I wish there was a paraprofessional in every classroom, and it's just unaffordable at this time, so we're sharing them. 
So uh, para paraprofessionals are given to a school and they assist during, you know, high need <coughs> times, you know, bathroom time, certain activities. But the kids are learning. I mean, it's a great environment. I've made sure, obviously, as superintendent, the best part of my day is visiting your schools and seeing what's happening. So for your child to come home not happy, is he, is he not getting the attention you think he needs, or what do you think is the reason? No, um, I think it's because it's, I understand as a, as a professional being a teacher, it's tough to deal with 27 students by yourself. So he doesn't like to be yelled. You know, when a teacher has to raise their voice, it makes it uncomfortable for some children. So um, that is uncomfortable for him to go to school where people are Well, it, it might be when I'm out there, you know, and I'm sure at some point in time a teacher might have to get their attention. But I can honestly tell you when I'm out in those classrooms and I'm out there with other administrators, I'm walking around with the principals, I choose where I'm going, people are not telling me. And when I'm walking into those classes, I am seeing kids, and, and again, I count heads right away. I can't tell you I like it at all, because I would like a classroom with at the very most 20 in a kindergarten class. I would like a paraprofessional so the children can get the attention that they need, especially when they're learning for the first time. And we're counting on you as parents to help us offset when you ask some of the things you can do. But I'm not seeing classes out of control. I actually was at the Kennedy School and they had about 25, 26. And I talked to some of the veteran teachers that I've known, you know, teaching a lot of years. And they've got their hands full. You know, there are lots of little children wanting attention, wanting to give an answer, but I've seen kids engaged in the educational process. Like I said, I wish it was different, so when it comes time for that child that needs maybe additional support, that the teacher would be able to give that, and that's probably the area that's hurting the most. But I have not seen out of control classrooms. You can going forward when you're negotiating. You can look at your budget. We were very surprised, uh, unfortunately, by the things that had happened. We were surprised with the charter school. We were surprised uh, with the Foundation Budget Review Commission not going forward. We were surprised with losing money for the economically disadvantaged that had never happened. So we have just kind of crawled through the past couple of years. So when we go into negotiations, we will certainly negotiate knowing what our pocketbook is and doing the very best we can. Yeah. Okay, so anybody that didn't have a chance, and I'll go back to there are a couple of people that have second questions. Sir? I'm sorry, can you ask me that when again? Was, when was the last time you yourself yeah. used a math problem, a math problem that was included uh, letters and numbers? Letters and numbers. Algebra. Yeah. Oh, um, I can't tell you the last time I used algebra. Right. right. When was the last time you used money? Well, I used money today. <laughs> so how come our school, right? Okay, no, no, no. Sorry, I want to hear you, yeah. The, the whole country, I mean the whole nation, right? So we teach people, we teach kids things sometimes that they're never going to use in their, in their life, right? But money is something that people are going to use every day. Yes, our education will teach kids how money works. We could do better with budgeting and finances and all of those kinds of things. So how come it's probably a revolt because the colleges say you need to have algebra one and algebra two, you need to have geometry, you need to have, and we do it. If the kids are going to go to college, I'm not going to be the one to say, hey, we, now again, when you talk about a revolt of a country, you know, shouldn't we make sure that our kids know our history? I feel terrible because of all the mandates that we do have, and people will say to us, our kids don't even know our own, you know, history here in Brockton. Or do they know some of the things? I can remember driving in my car, and I probably was a crazy parent, and I would quiz my little children. They're now 34 and 31. 
But I would say to them, who's the governor of the state? What state do we live in? What's the capital city? You know, we're, we're driving around doing errands. And I would make sure I asked so that they understood that we weren't just living in, you know, this little place of, Bro well, actually a big place of Brockton. So I don't disagree with you at all. I would love to have some great electives that we struggle to find time to even get them into the schedule. So I really think as a country we need to come to terms with things that you're saying because it's a much bigger picture than, than what we're doing here in Brockton. But I don't disagree with you. by the name of Cedric Turner, who educates kids in financial literacy. Just the things that you're talking about, investing, money, um, you know, business, stock market, all this stuff. It's a great program at the middle school and at the high school. And his kids um, compete uh, statewide and even in some of the um, place in some uh, you know, Connecticut and you know, New England states. And we're winning. Um, he brought me, he, was, he has a very good relationship with Bentley College, and um, Bentley College has uh, a unique stock market uh, program where basically they can run a stock market. So he asked me to go. So we played this game. So I'm playing the game and I'm like, oh wow, I doubled my money, I'm great. These kids were tripling and quadrupling their money in his class. He is such a great. In, he has such a great impact on these kids. So believe it or not, we that is a program that some people wanted us to cut. I wouldn't cut it because so many kids that do not get financial literacy just because you know their parents might not be exposed to it or whatever reason, he provides so many of these kids with this opportunity. I couldn't cut it. But some people will say, well, that's another teacher. That, that's the juggle that we have as a school committee. OK, we bring another teacher in. But then here's 300 kids, 200 kids that don't have a clue about these issues. That you know, These are kids, you know, and by the way, ladies, the girls beat the boys in the stock market. So feel good about yourself in terms of money. Um, so, but, I mean, these are kids that are being exposed to all these issues. Um, you know, top companies he has these relationships with. Um, he has a good relationship with the people at Bentley College. There are going to be kids from Brockton who never have any idea about going to a place like Bentley or, or going into finance that are now it's opening their eyes. I mean, these are the, these are the things as a, as a school committee person that we try to keep in place for kids to show these kids the exposure that they, that they need. And you know, I hear you, believe me. No, it it makes common sense. sense. So, well, so Mr. Minicello, what, what you're hearing here, and the sad part about what Tom is telling you, and it is a wonderful program, and we struggle to keep the money in the budget. It's an additional after-school program and we don't have the capacity to bring it to every middle school. So what middle school is it at? I believe it's at the, um, no, it's at the Ashfield North and the high school. Well, the, the reason, the reason I'm at, the reason Was I'm at the Plough, but I don't think we were able to keep it there. And, and, and the reason I'm saying that is because, I mean, it's not the maybe, uh, maybe what's the name of me, because fortunately now, you know, that, that, I, that I'm exposed to that, and that's the kind of line of work that I do, and I always thought about maybe, uh, going to a high school or the superintendent uh, to see how I can help voluntarily to teach because that's what I do, you know, teach people about things like that for free. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to charge anybody for it, but and just it dawned on me like how, you know, we, we teach people, kids, on some of the things that maybe they're never going to use in their life, but money, something they're going to use every day, and yet we don't have things like that. Well, I'll take you up on your offer to volunteer. We can introduce you to, to Mr. Turner, who does do a fabulous job. I changed my mind. One more question. All this thing, my child is a fluff. And I would like them to sign up for this program. So we have a program. Yeah. And I would like to know what the 
don't have that option. Not right now when they go to the high school, but even then, you know, like we said, it's, it's an additional program. It is limited. I wish it was something that we were able to bring and get the personnel. I think Mr. Turner also struggles with finding the personnel to be able to be part of the program. What, what year is your child? Well, um, my child, is in a, she's in the eighth grade right now. Okay. So, but I have a son that's in, that's in the high school, and I've never heard of it. Let's I call him Power to, Yourselves. I only have the financial literacy class that they mm -hmm. give to the kids when they're yes. seniors, but yeah. not yeah. maybe in the ninth grade. Now. He does teach, I'm trying to think of what it's called. Yeah, yeah. but it is called Empower Yourselves. Talking about the program, he thinks it's very beneficial. My child's at the high school. Can he or she get involved or whatever? You know. Other questions? Because I know the time is running out, and a lot of you have come out this evening. Okay. Um, my name is Jadon, and my son goes to the Raymond School, and I'm very like um, very concerned about my son's education, as far as like you know um, how's he doing, you know, um, as far as you know safety wise, environment. And what he's learning from the school. And I find that the Raymond School is really good because they're really passionate about, you know, teaching the kids and making sure they learn. So the problem is I have as a parent is, you know, I hear a lot of deficit and that rings a bell. Like, I mean, that kind of like brings up like red flags for me. And so I mean, I like the fact that I'm hearing there's like a lot of opportunities mm -hmm. and, you know, in all the schools, but I think it should be like across the board, like in all the schools. But if we're having so much deficit as a parent, what can I do to kind of help, you know, um, with that gap or with Well, the gap deficit? is funding. I mean, you know, clearly we're trying to keep things in a balance. So. Again, when we talk about a program like Empower Yourself, that's an extra program. We do have programs for students that are talented and gifted, and there's a test involved for students to be able to have accelerated learning. We have all kinds of, again, if your child has a special need, we make sure that we're paying attention to what the children need. If your child is an English language learner, we're trying to make sure that they have opportunities so that they become mainstreamed and can eventually you know, get a high school credential and go on to be successful. So I don't want you to think that we don't, no matter what school you go into, we've got the same math curriculum for elementary, <clears throat> the same English curriculum, the same opportunities. When you have additional programs is when they're in different schools or special programs that are only in, we can't have them in every single one of the schools. We have them in particular schools. As far as what you can do about the deficit, you heard me clearly that we're looking for advocacy. I'm told that a Proposition 2.5 override will never pass in this city. So we have to decide as a community what's important to us and where we want our money spent. And those are your elected officials. So I, I, I'm not going to tell you it's going to be easy. We're facing, like a lot of other urban districts, kind of an uphill battle because we're so dependent on state funding. And I hope it resonated with you when I started out by telling you about a community that might have flipped, so Brockton is 80% from the state, 20% from our city. And that's all we get. You can have another community that's very wealthy, that pays 80% themselves, and gets 20% from the state, and then they add another two, three, four, five million dollars, because they want to make sure that their kids have one-to-one -one devices, or new science labs, or all of those kind of opportunities. Those are things that are very frustrating, and when you hear me talk about equity in education, the state has got to realize that's not equity, especially when our students need those same opportunities. So we are fighting that fight. We're fighting it within our own city. We're fighting it within the state. I'll ask you to pay attention to what we're doing to be able to, to support those things. Um, when you talk about a Proposition 2.5 override, the mayor has to sponsor that question or has to Actually, I'm trying to think what the word is. Basically, it has to be recommended to the city council to put it on a ballot. And it should be on the ballot for people to decide if they want to put an extra. And, and here's how I did explain it. How many go out in the morning and you asked if I spent money today? 
How many go out and buy a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or a donut or a muffin? How many do it almost every day? Coffee, Good. Most of you are better than I am. So every day I buy a, a giant cup of coffee unless I can find Mr. Minicello who buys it for me at the Honeydew. <coughs> so I end up spending probably on average at least $5 a day. And the way that I figured it out is if everybody gave up one cup of coffee or tea a week at $5, multiply that by 52 weeks, we'd be able to support our school districts in a very different way. So these are the kind of things I think we have to decide, you know, as a city, what's important for us to do. It's one thing for us to be advocating with the state, and it's another thing for us to take care of our own children as a city. So when I tell you about a town that meets foundation and then puts in an extra two, three, four, five million dollars because of something special they want. Maybe they want to build a new state-of-the-art high school or schools. Maybe they want to make sure all the kids have one-to-one -one devices, but they're making those decisions. So that's what I would ask you as a school community to hold us accountable to do the best we can with the money that we have, and then by that same token to make sure our elected officials understand that our kids are not an afterthought, that that should be at the beginning every time they're doing a city budget. So I was recently surprised to learn that students in the school district have no opportunity to evaluate their teachers. Is this uh, something that, and I don't know too much about teacher evaluation and all that, but uh, coming from the other, other industries that have worked, there's always an opportunity for the educator or the service provider to get some mm -hmm. feedback. Uh, do you have any comments on that? I do. Yeah, one of the things when you look at, there's a new um, evaluation system, and when I say new, it's probably been here five years, and it's, it's no longer, it used to be individual in a community, now the state has decided on an educational evaluation system from the superintendent all the way down to the teachers in the classrooms. So one of the things that is suggested, but it's not a mandate, so they're held to high standards. If you have a teacher, no matter how many years they've been in the district, that is underperforming or needs improvement or isn't improving their practice, these teachers can be let go. And that is exactly what we're doing. We try to support them. Understand, when you've made an investment in a teacher, you do everything you can to support their practice before you decide they're not in a profession they belong in. One of the things that has been talked about is a survey. So it's not an individual evaluation where your, te your student has an English class and they evaluate Mrs. Smith in the English class. But there is, I believe, a survey that you can look at and you'd negotiate it with the teacher's union. So we are going into negotiations. It could be something that um, you think that's valuable because students give feedback, or what, what do you think? I think it's valuable in the sense uh, when you receive any service, which getting educated is a service you're receiving, if you think of it like that, then it's mm -hmm. always, whether it's to the teacher or the administrator or anyone, that could be helpful for them yeah. to, yeah. yes. So I don't disagree with you. I know uh, when I was in law school, they made us evaluate every professor, and those evaluations went up for everybody to take a look at um, and make your decisions about selecting your classes. You obviously were paying a lot of money to, to attend those classes. I think in college, I forget. Those of you that have kids in college, I'm sure they evaluate the professors, either, either with something that's standard. Oh, so they do evaluate. I would think a very good teacher, I never taught at the high school level, I taught at middle school and elementary, but a really good teacher would have the students evaluate them, would give them a, an evaluation to fill out at the end of a class. So if a teacher wants to be reflective and wants to be better at their practice, I would think that would be an excellent opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, it returns, because there have been many returns to Department of Public Schools. Does that money come back to that child? When do they return? So, good question. So, October 1st, the charter school has to let the state know how many children they have sitting in front of them. And if the children are from Randolph, they get the Randolph per pupil cost. If there are children from Brockton, then they get the cost of what that per pupil would be from Brockton. If the student that was sitting in the charter 
on October 1st, comes back to the public schools on October 2nd, we do not get funding for that student. Not any part of it. Um, you have to wait till the next October 1st if the student is still sitting in front of you. Um, and the same thing for the charter. If we count a child on October 1st, that's our money. If the charter chooses and the child decides to go in December, then they don't have funding for that child until the next year also. So it is the same for both. My gripe is just what I told you. You should look at, it shouldn't just be what Brockton's per pupil cost is. You should look at the, the child. And there probably should be, understand that charters have to pay their bills also, but there should be a, a formula that supports a charter but does not necessarily take away from a formula that's been made to work in a system like ours. And it's a blended rate. Okay, so I'm not sure. So your child has an individual educational plan. So your child is a special needs child. What school do they go to? Um, Asheville. The Asheville School. Okay, Asheville Middle School. So you're asking me that a child, I, I'm not sure what you mean by turn down. I would say that if, they, if you want your child to come to another school, and then oh, see, oh, oh. Will they tell you, okay, that costs so much money for your son to move from here to okay. South Shore, Colorado, Okay, well, we, we never do that. We have the schools that are within the Brockton Public Schools, and if you want your child, you know, transferred, there is what we call a, a choice, but it's a limited choice, and that's why I talked about transportation. If you choose for your child to go to a school outside of Brockton, we have no say about that. If you're talking about a special needs youngster going to a private or uh, an outside placement, that is through the educational process. So I'm not sure if that's what you're asking me. Um, because why I ask for that is I would like my son to go to South Shore Collaborative. Yeah. But, um, is that a spe that's a special, special needs school? Yeah. That goes through the educational process. So it is a team process. And th there's nobody, and thank goodness, I taught special education for a lot of years. The state is very careful to protect the rights of special education students and parents. So if the school district does not feel that that is a placement that we feel is appropriate for your child and we feel we have an appropriate placement, you know, we will not necessarily approve that placement. You have a right to um, reject the educational plan. It goes through mediation, it goes through an appeals process, and in the end the state steps in and they decide what's in the best interest of the child uh, as far as the best educational opportunity for the child. So special education students do have um, certainly uh, protections for them. But as a parent, if you don't think that, they, they will tell you that we tried everything. But as a parent, if you don't think what they have tried, if it's not enough, can you just make the decision and, and then throw it? Or it, because they don't, they, it doesn't seem like it's easy for them to work with you and say, okay, let's do the transfer, let's see how he does in this school. It's hard for me to answer individual questions in front of a group. The only thing that I can tell you is as a special education parent, um, I meet with parents all the time. We want to make sure that you're treated fairly, but the law protects you very well. It might not always be in agreement with what the parent decides, which is why the process can go to a state mediator and a de decision is made at that point. But we try to make decisions in the best interests of the children. Any other questions? All right, thank you all for coming out this evening. Um, I do appreciate your um, time and coming out and sharing your questions. I will make sure that I follow up with the school committee on things that are concerning you. Um, and we will have, I think, three other forums. I believe there's one in January, February, March. Please prepare your questions ahead of time. Or if you're coming from PACS, if you want to ask the PAC if there are questions that they would like to bring here in case they're not able to be here. So again, thank you very much. Thank you.